Hello and welcome to the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour and WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. We're recording this on Sunday morning, June 11th, 2023. I'm Larry Rhodes or DJ Doubter 5. And as usual, we have our co host Wombat on the line with us. Hello, Wombat. Yo, happy Pride. Happy Pride. And our special guest today is Boudreaux from Kentucky. Welcome. Hey, hey, guys. Uh, Digital Free Thought Radio Hour is a talk radio show about atheism, free thought, rational thought, humanism, and the sciences. And conversely, we'll also talk about religion, religious faiths, gods, holy books, and superstition. And if you get the feeling you're the only non-believer in your town, well, you're just not. Here in Knoxville, in the middle of the Bible Belt, we have a group of over a thousand of us. We're the Atheist Society of Knoxville, or ASK, and we'll tell you more about us after the mid-show break. Be sure to stick around. Wombat, what's our topic today? We're catching up with our friend Boudreaux, who's gone on a really cool trip, and then also talking about biblical diets. How to stay lean, yeah, how to stay lean and have good cuisine in an <laughs> age where you know everyone's constantly thinking about their body proportions. Why don't they just do what the Bible tells them with regard to what the best way to look is. Bujo, good to see you though. I haven't seen you in a while, but it's I've seen your pics and I've seen that you've been busy. Why don't you catch us up? Yeah. Uh so uh, hey guys. Um we went on a fun um uh, uh trip of vacation with a really big family or 13 of us. Wow. Uh, my wife and kids, her dad and her mom and then her two sisters and their families. Um That's so a lot there, of people. There are a lot I of hope people. It, we hope had it didn't a, turn out like family vacation movies <laughs> <laughs> right now actually it was it was uh pretty uneventful in terms of mishaps which uh usually somebody loses luggage or or a kid yeah or a kid yeah. uh yeah uh, we, we did uh, have a, one kid i don't right. star steven it's like oh that's rough that's rough yeah uh, I, so where we, where'd you go this time so we flew into mexico city uh right. but then quickly flew down south to chiapas uh, a region near Guatemala, um, and did some um, uh, adventuring around there. Uh, uh, we did actually get to step foot in Guatemala, which was really neat. Uh, no passports or anything like that. Uh, and then I hope the border c- control is not listening. Um, <laughs> and then uh, and then we got to see some Mayan ruins, uh, and then nice. back to Mexico City for a few days. Uh, but we got to see waterfalls, canyons. I mean, just I'll post it all on 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 Facebook, but, um, there were two kind of interesting religious, uh, things that happened that we can explore more here or, uh, just sure, sure, sure. I want, I want to hear about it. I want to hear about it. I have some weird thoughts about this too. So, so George, one of our, 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 uh, uh, has, has joined this show before, um, Mm -hmm. commented to, to the group about how we were looking at the Mayan cross. Um, Mm -hmm. obviously the, the, you know, the Mayan religion, was was pretty big in this Chiapas region that that didn't didn't take the Catholicism kind of uh, uh, influx that was coming in, and they stayed with their kind of Mayan traditions. Um, but they had a cross, and it looks eerily similar to um, you know the the cross from uh, overseas. And right. you know George's comment was, you know, why is that? You know, as a scientist, he's like, well, why are those so similar? And uh, you know, uh, 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 the the religious response is well. You know, maybe that's divinely inspired, right? It's sure. Uh, it's yeah. it's the symbol that was you know given to both of these groups, which I find kind of kind of silly in the sense that I mean they're both talking about two very different god or gods, right? I mean, um, you know, some religions don't think of a one single god. So I don't know a reaction from you guys. Uh, is it divinely inspired, or is there some other reason? I mean, that, it's obviously divinely inspired. What's the what's the conversation? <laughs> End of. Let's just hang up the call. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I remember there was a really cool sermon that I saw. When I when I say cool, I mean just like you know, fascinating. Where they're talking about a particular protein. Proteins are these things in your body that have a very particular shape that do very specific functions, um, and your body produces them out of like a long chain of amino acids, and they eventually fold to a very particular structure that's used for a bunch of different stuff. Uh, if you change the the order of the amino acids, you change the eventual structure of how that protein folds. And there's one protein that is responsible for uh, some vital life functions in your body. 
And the thing is, the protein is is a fairly, I mean, while it does fold into a particular shape, it can be it can be missed around. It's not like a rigid structure, but sometimes it looks like this. And when I do this, I'm doing a cross shape and it looks like this sometimes. Yeah. And so the sermon was like, there's a there's a protein in your body. I talked to scientists, I talked to biochemists, I talked to philosophers around the world, and they said, prove to me there's a God in your protein. Prove to me there's a God in your... It's like, well, you can't live without this protein. Guess what it looks like? Puts it up on the screen. Yeah. It's, 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 <laughs> and I first thing I did was I, I Googled that same protein, and it's like, yes, sometimes it's like this, sometimes it's like a ball, sometimes it looks like a little devil with horns on it, because these things are flexible. Sure. Yeah. So... Uh, in the event that the times that looks like a cross, do I find that as divine inspiration for how it actually always looks, or is it just a coincidence? And I'm I'm fine with things being coincidences because coincidences are demonstrable happen all the time, and they happen all the time. And not only that, but it's a really simple structure. For example, if the cross was a very ornate thing, like what the the Jewish star, like Uh, uh, something much more elaborate rather than just two lines with symmetry overlapping each other at right angles. I would Mm -hmm. then say maybe there's something to it, but otherwise I see the cross in like the alphabet. I see the cross when I drop a bunch of toothpicks on the ground, Mm -hmm. I see the cross, you know, everywhere. Yeah. I, 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 it's, it's just an intersection of two lines and Uh, I couldn't be, I can't reprimand a, a, a culture for appropriating it. Yeah. with with like some sort of copyright infringement when it's just such a basic shape can i also point out this <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah yeah like we can the do human that. body yeah human body is symmetrical we shape. love bilateral symmetry it's like yeah. the coolest thing ever if now i would say this there's like this idea in u.s copyright culture where you can't copyright the word the for example right you can't put a trademark on a, a sound, a sound effect that's like the Wilhelm scream or like literally wow. something that's the sound of like a gunshot sure. and be like, hey, they stole our sound. Your sound clip's only five seconds long. You can't copyright that. It's too short. It's not yeah. meaningful. In the same way, I think we should have some credence that other people left to their own devices, if they're still humans, um, it should be indicative of the fact that we came up with the same shapes because there's just something inherent to human preference for bilateral symmetry and simple right. designs. And the more Not simple, just human, bilateral symmetry is all through the animal kingdom. Exactly, exactly. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And so I just find that to be the case. Larry, I'm sorry for, for overstepping this. There's a lot of stuff I can talk about this, but did you have a <laughs> thought on this? Uh, no, no, go ahead. You're doing fine. I just there's to hear, hear it. Uh, Buja, you might know this because you went to to Greece and Rome, but like they have coins that you can like look at and say, hey, here are old fashioned coins from this really old period of time. And when you look at them, they're not fancy. They're just like slabs of metal with like some very stamp basic, on it, yeah, yeah mm-hmm. stamp engraving. You're like, why aren't these coins fancier? Like how, you know, it is here with our industrialization. And it's like they were fancy. These coins used to be super, super ornate. And then they realized it's a pain in the butt (laughs) to grave each of these coins. Let's just, it's just Caesar's face, just like kind of like, and then just get it out the door so we can use it as money. It, Mm -hmm. the simplicity of the design took over and it showed that the hallmark of a lot of designing is simplicity, not complexity. And so, oh, go ahead, Buja. Oh, Buja was taking a step out. So the main reason is why when I look at a cross, I look at a very simple structure, uh, whether it could be used for crucifixion or for holding some like elaborate stuff that you can like um, or design ornately or to put or working as a puppet. Right. Or to like build the what do you call them? The hilts for a sword. Like uh, it's a very uniform structure with a very simple design when you just have like a long line and like a flat parallel or yeah. perpendicular line to it it's a yeah. very complementary structure for a lot of things because it's inherently simple and it's, it's fundamentally mm-hmm. applies to a lot of different stuff right so i'm not surprised that i see it from other cultures is my is my main takeaway but is it divinely inspired who knows because i can't prove <laughs> that divinely inspired things even exist in the first place but i'm not going to entertain the thought until i have a good reason to believe that such a thing exists in the first place too Go on so ahead. if if every religion or at least um a vast majority of all religions 
mm. um, all had that simple symbol. Yeah. That would, that would make me scratch my head a little bit more. I would scratch I mean, my head a little bit more. Yeah. Absolutely. Again, yeah, yeah, yeah. it would be an yeah. incredible coincidence. But then, but then I'd be like, you know, if, I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, on the subject of scratching my head more, if it was more complex in its design, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if everybody did it, then yes, absolutely. But when we're in the situation where we are now, where a lot of popular regions don't have stuff like that, and it's a very, very simple structure, like a, a, a one-year-old could draw it. Like I remember you know, anyone can like just yeah. do this, right? Like you play tic-tac-toe, you can draw across, right? Well, we're, we're also cherry picking too. Why, mm. why are we, why are we looking at the Mayan religion and, um, you know, Catholicism or, uh, you know, coming out of Jerusalem? Why are we cherry picking those sure. and asking, oh, these are so similar instead of right. asking, you know, yeah. the well, Buddhists. I looked up the, I mean, the cross itself is not just a Christian cross. As a matter of fact, a plain cross is is called a Latin cross. Mm. And if you look it up, it's a derivative of daggers or obelisks Ooh. used to indicate death. The cross originated as a pagan symbol in Asia and mm. Africa countries. And then it was a platform for crucifixion in Rome. Right. So it had a, a much more ancient uh, uh, source or origination. I, th Should I, we think, oh, I think we're overlooking the more important question, though, where it's how is it that we have a culture that has the ability to make all these beautiful monuments that still stand today. Like there's more stuff standing in Mayan culture than there is from ancient Christian times. Like you go to Jerusalem, all that stuff's been leveled out, you know, like it's, it's people still there, but I, if you go to Mayan culture, like they still have the temples, they still have the, the, the weird sports ball circles up yeah. in the air. Like you can like, you can still play that game there like all you just need is a fresh bladder it's like the uh -huh. the monuments they built last so much longer why weren't any of them built in the scope of christianity like why weren't they why does this ancient culture that was capable of so much build at least one thing that coincides with the narrative that's presented to us by christianity that would at least be a more powerful tool. Not so much the idea of a cross, but like if they built a, G a giant Jesus statue or like a Noah's Ark instead of one that had to, you have to go to Kentucky to go see, right? <laughs> or if they built something that was just like, hey, by the way, this about a flood or something that's like narrative consistent with the Bible or any other religion that's, you know, popular right now. It doesn't have to even be specific to Christianity. I just want some congru congru congruity between all these different ancient temples shrines monuments and 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 the story that we're told because it's it's all pointing in different directions what yeah. do you think Pedro? i i love that because one of the other uh examples i was going to bring up and you surely both of you have seen a meme floating around where it talks about the egyptian pyramids and the right. mayan pyramids mm. and they talk about how hey here's another another data point sample size of two but these two cultures built these structures right and they're so similar Mm. And it's like divine inspiration, you know, sure. and, and, and the, you know, the, the engineer in, in me is thinking the exact or the roughly what the meme was saying is this is a great way to stack blocks. Yes. So they don't fall down for a really, really long time. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. All it's of a, the structures. It's a basic that, shape, a yeah. wide base, a short top. Yeah. That's basically uh -huh. it. And it, yeah. it lasts, it lasts so long. All the structures that were uniquely different and weird and mm and not the same right. fell down crumbled. right right yeah. look at stonehenge <laughs> yeah. like look at yeah. stonehenge right now like that yeah. thing is halfway standing up like yeah. you look at that you look at stonehenge and you compare it to like a pyramid or like a mayan uh temple you're like you guys aren't, aren't even this is just yeah. a couple of rocks it's like it looked way cooler yeah. back then it's like yeah but yeah. it's yeah. all falling apart <laughs> like yeah we didn't have the good engineers to tell us wide at the bottom small at the top we didn't figure that that yet it's like okay well you know so other people did what do you think larry no oh, that's fine i want to get back to this divine inspiration idea i sure. uh, say we can't you know the, we don't believe that divine inspiration actually happens because there's no divine i mean there's no god but there are a lot of uh artworks that are inspired by the idea of the divine uh, mm -hmm. and there's a, a distinction to be drawn there so that uh, uh people understand what you're talking about yeah and and in in with regard to the artwork, there's a really funny thing that you 
should really check out, which is what does Jesus look like in other countries, right? Because if you go to, and I and I had the benefit of growing up in California, so like I, I would go to, and we were like shopping around churches for a lot too. We were Christian back then. Uh -huh. uh, but when you go to like a predominantly uh, white church, Jesus is like blue eyed. He gives you a Bible where he has like a very basic, I work at Lowe's sort of like hair, uh, facial hair. He's got mm -hmm. like the perfect crop. Like I, I just got out of Mormon school haircut. I have the, oh, I don't even have the Bible now, but like, it's my first Bible looked like, uh, Tim Allen, like Jesus was basically <laughs> oh, <really? Tim> Allen. <laughs> right. And then you went to like the more churches that were more Catholic, more Mexican. And like all of a sudden Jesus isn't like this big bulky lumberjack brownie guy. He's like <laughs> this long haired flowing hair, green eyed, mm -hmm. six pack app, sort of like very Italian looking dude mm -hmm. like he looks like he's like uh my name is luigi my name is pizza uh like mm -hmm. i i i'm not there's a, a reason kid. for that <laughs> it is it is and yeah. I, I in my head i was just like i don't really parse these two they're just both fair-skinned people and but it didn't really hit me until i went to a church that was for black people or mostly black people and i saw a black jesus on the cross and that's when my brain started going like wait a second that's not jesus that guy's from africa wait a second Black people are from Africa. Hold on a second. Or like, you know, like in my head, I'm starting to think, wait a second. Oh, wait a second. Why does Jesus look Italian? <laughs> go to the Catholic churches. Why does Jesus look like a white guy when I go to mostly white churches? And and then I, I looked it up and it turns out there's an Asian Jesus. If you go to like Korea, they don't like try to sell uh, when they when they proselytize back there. They don't try to sell a white Jesus. They sell like a very vaguely looking Asian Jesus, that's also on a cross. And I'm thinking to myself, you can go on Google Images and you can see what just Jesus looks like from any country. The way how art is depicted is way is is sort of a way to reinforce the the inherent biases or the the beauty standards, if you will, of the people that they're trying to sell it to. Like you can sell something a lot easier if it's familiar to people compared to if it's something entirely brand new, even if the storylines don't make sense. Like, why do these fair-skinned people exist in, like, Persia? Like, makes no sense. And I thought, well, at least we'll, we don't do this anywhere else. And it turns out we totally do. Because how many <laughs> times have we seen a Roman movie or a movie that takes place in ancient Rome where everyone has British accents, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know that's not how they talk back there. I know that's not how they talk back there. But Americans associate foreign <laughs> with English, right? Yeah. Or, like, the English accent. And we just, we don't connect the dots until we talk to a person who's from England. And they're like... That's not, I, we live right next to that country. They can't find any Greek actors. It's like, I don't know why you're angry about this. Like, I'm very angry about this. If you yeah. talk to people who are from Greece and Rome, it's like, we don't talk like that. What's going on? Yeah. And so uh, there's a video game series called um, Assassin's Creed and Prince of Persia. I don't know if you heard about those. They That's finally incredible. started doing acts. Oh, this is the most infuriating one. They did a, a, it's a historical game where you get to be an assassin. You run around and stuff like that. They did a game. It's a, Assassin's Creed is made by a French company. They are in France and they made a game that was during the French Revolution. Every single person in the game has an English accent. <laughs> and it makes it made no sense to anybody. But they're like, we're making this for Americans because they don't understand that French people have French accents. I was like, why? We know, we know game made a million dollars or game sold millions and millions of copies, but it really blew everyone's mind. They finally fixed it though. And they made finally the ones in Greek have Greek actors and the ones in Persia have Persian actors. And they finally started doing this crazy radical thing where they changed the skin color of the person to not always just be like a generic white guy if it takes place in like like a very ethnic area. So like now the new Prince of Persia is like this brown skinned person and people are like, oh, he, that's not my Prince of Persia. And I'm like, why are you nah. angry? Because have you, have you not seen Persians? They kind of look like that. It's like, oh, mm. anyway, <laughs> that's my weird soapbox. But yes, absolutely. People will modify art to, mm. to to be propaganda so that it could be familiar and more easily absorbed by the the in, intended demographic and clientele really sure yeah i played the assassin's creed where it was ancient greece yes and you're, you're running around you hear people talking and it's everyone speaking english with a weird like italian like uh voice really it's like you know what i mean it's like uh, but it's it, Right, it's yeah. supposed to sound Greek, but it really sounds like your Mario's running around you. Hold <laughs> 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 So I, I hear you. And then wasn't there a movie, Thirteen Warriors, where they they started the movie 
mm. and with subtitles and they were speaking the correct dialect. And then eventually um, and Antonio Banderas, I think, learned the language and it, it, it went to English. Okay. <laughs> it completely okay. just to, oh. for, for the audience. I think. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I, I will throw out some highlights if we're on this subject. There are some movies that do it right, but a little, but only because the context of the movie allows for it. And one of them was The Last Samurai by with Tom Cruise. I don't know if you guys ever seen that. He gets a lot of flack for being a white guy in a movie called The Last Samurai. But if you watch the movie, it's not like he's taking over Japan and he's like supposed to be a Japanese person. He's clearly an American that was like contracted to help a bunch of like Japanese samurai. And he learns from the process to be a better person and like he gets folded into the ranks but he's not even i don't even think he's the last samurai in the movie he's just unfortunately the box art poster guy to sell the movie but there is a last samurai in the movie that is a japanese person it's just an unfortunate movie yeah. poster the other one yeah. was um ghost in a shell i don't know if you know about this but it was uh uh scar jo, uh scar johansson yeah. she was portraying a japanese person who his body was put into a cybernetic body of like a white person and she still identified as Japanese could still speak Japanese but like her body was like a ghost in a shell like that's the whole concept of the whole movie and people were really angry it's like why isn't she an Asian person it's like she's not even an Asian person in the in the source material that they're pulling it from she's just like a beautiful person and her body is like just a model of a robot that they can put in so that was yeah. interesting too I'd have those movies weren't worth the flack it was just people trying to get upset because people like getting upset the A's too yeah well we're getting a little far afield uh, do you want to try to get back to the uh biblical diet or or whatever that we were Larry that's a terrible transition golly that was this the worst transition <laughs> I'm not really good at transitions if you haven't picked up on that Okay, okay, okay. Just, just we ran into a wall. How about uh, we take a break and come back after the show and we can go into biblical diet? Okay, sounds real good. Sweet, sweet, uh, sweet. Uh, welcome. Well, this is the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour and WOZO Radio. We're broadcasting from uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. We'll be right back after this short break. Welcome back to the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Let's take just a moment to talk about the Atheist Society of Knoxville. ASK was founded in 2002. We're in our 21st year now and have over 1,000 members. We have weekly in-person meetings every Tuesday evening in Knoxville's Old City at Barley's Taproom and Pizzeria. Look for us inside at the high-top tables or if it's pretty outside, out on the deck. Um, if you'd like to join us, uh, go to our website at knoxvilleatheist.org. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook or meetup.com or just Google Knoxville Atheist. It's just that simple. By the way, if you don't live in Knoxville, you should still go to meetup and look for a group in your town. Don't find one. Start one. one. That's right. Wombat, where are you going to pick up? Bujo, thank you so much for sharing the 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 fun trip that you have with your family. Thirteen people all staying together, going from one place to another. That's that yeah. is both an accomplishment and a fun time. I was just wondering, like, how do you feed that many people? Compliment. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was uh, some of the meals were included. You know, it was part of the hotel, or it was a bed and breakfast, or um, sometimes we just went to like vendors and got food. Um, so. A lot of uh, pushing tables together and that kind of a thing. Uh, yeah. You just but walk into the stores like, hey, can you feed 13 people? It's like, uh, <laughs> we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Yeah. 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 What's the strategy, fun. though? Do you feed them any kind of food or do you feed them the biblical diet? Yeah, well, I didn't know about the biblical diet until this morning. What? You didn't know about the biblical diet? It's the one way to stay truly with God as you try to uh, match your lean with your cuisine <laughs> and 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 feeling what is it uh pristine with god <laughs> <laughs> so there's actually a way to stay completely so you know some religions have diet restrictions right this isn't a new thing but christianity hacks also has some dietary restrictions if not characters in the bible have had to deal with uh restrictions on what they can eat and and what access to food they have is particularly when they're like going through deserts and stuff and i say to ourselves why don't we follow those same guidelines today 
Why are there still Christians that are wishy-washy cherry picking what they can eat and what they can't eat? If you if you do that, in my head, you are only furthering your chances of not saving your soul. So what we could do today is share the guidelines for a proper Christian diet and see how we feel about it, both as non-believers and then maybe even put on our Christian hats and figure out how we feel about it uh, as a Christian. So the first one is your breakfast, right? Every good breakfast, every good day starts with a good breakfast. A biblical breakfast is manna monotony. So you'll start your day with a hearty portion of manna straight from heaven. Don't worry about the variety or taste. Manna is a divine gift that tastes like honey wafers, as said in Exodus 16.31. Warning, consuming manna exclusively may result in breakfast boredom and severe carbohydrate overload. What do you guys think about that? I mean, it's well, <laughs> where do you get the manna? It oh, literally that's... falls okay. from heaven? It does fall from heaven, but it does taste like uh, uh, honey wafers. Well, I've never seen it all. <laughs> I, mean, I, I have a dearth of manna here. <laughs> okay, okay. That's true. That's true. We may have a hard time making manna. Though you I, might starve it, to death if you eat only manna. Yeah, the billion-dollar question, though, is why hasn't... Um, why isn't manna something that you can buy from like a Christian organization or a Christian store? Like, why don't they just make manna? We already have wafers and we that can would make be them blasphemous. Sweet. Really? Only God can make manna. Oh, but I, I mean, I don't know if you bless it, like God made the world. I'm part of the world. So if I make something, God made it like, like I'm sure there's a crafty Christian out there. It's just like, Hey, I made, <laughs> I made manna. Like it, it's not that bad. Uh, <laughs> okay. Somebody's missing a marketing opportunity. Apparently. Exactly. So here's the next one. Lunch. Every good diet has a good lunch. So lunch is fish frenzy. Enjoy an abundant selection of fish, including those with fins and scales. Leviticus 11, 9. You can savor a variety of seafoods such as salmon, tuna, or trout, but do not eat shellfish at all costs. Remember, shrimp and lobster are an abomination. To avoid monotony, try different preparations like grilling, baking, or poaching your fish. I actually like this. What do you think? Seems seems legit. Uh, I usually do fish for dinner instead of lunch. Yeah. But okay, I love okay, seafood. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. not, we didn't say seafood. So, Larry, this is how you get on the path to sin. We said <laughs> fish. fish. They have to have fins and scales. Oh, yeah. Oh, I like them too. But shrimp and lobster are an abomination. Like, oh, how I love my guys? shrimp. <laughs> it's it's always weird to me that God would deliberately make animals that you're not supposed to eat but also make them delicious at the same time too you know and to test you it's to test you ty come yeah, on yeah, yeah but like also make them immediately accessible and like still mm -hmm. like n these animals are in a weird part of the food chain where they're just eating dead animals they're doing i guess cleanup duty but they taste really good they're very easy to catch why isn't why why didn't you make them at least taste bad it's just a weird situation There's yeah, that a lot really of a lot of fish eat sea, eat crustaceans, but then yeah. you can eat the fish okay, but you can't eat the crustaceans. Good point. Ooh, Good yeah. point. Oh, I like that. Mm -hmm. That's even more convoluted than the uh, apple in Eden. So yeah. yeah. Good point. Yeah. Since it's Pride Month, we got to point out there's that fast food restaurant that I won't name. If Ooh. you eat their chicken, you have to hate gay people. But no, it's so you don't. Delicious. Yeah. No, you don't. Well, it's you part just, of it. You can just you're enjoy. funding their anti-gay <laughs> legislation efforts. You can, right. you can just like a chicken sandwich and, and, and try to vote appropriately. Uh, <laughs> Quell Quest for snacks. Listen, if you need a snack, everybody needs a snack. You can try a Quell Quest. What's a Quell Quest? It's to keep your energy levels high. Snack on a Quell, such as in be told, uh, be told in Numbers 11, 31 through 32. While the Bible describes the Lord providing quails in abundance for the Israelites in the desert, locating a convenient quail supplier might prove challenging but hey it's worth a try right uh my only concern about this is i thought we were going vegan with this diet and i feel like a lot of people who follow a vegan diet would have some issues by eating fish and quail and i think honey too is off the table Ooh, yeah that's a good point good point so everything we described today is not vegan does that mean vegans are abominations oh yeah heathens <laughs> They're at least difficult conversation partners. The reason why I bring that up is the next thing that we're talking about is the vegan option. This is for dinner. It's called Vegan Delights. Prepare a sumptuous feast of legumes, fruits, and vegetables. 
such as told in Genesis 1 29. Embrace the plant-based lifestyle. Enjoy lentils, chickpeas, and a rainbow of produce. You may experience endless flatulence and dietary imbalance, but remember, it's all part of the divine plan. That's the thing that we always forget, isn't it? That this is always part of a divine plan. There's no such thing as harm to your body if you're listening to God. What's the biblical basis for not eating honey? I hadn't heard that. It's not biblical. Uh, vegan. Right. Right. I mean, oh. it's like they won't. Uh, they don't drink milk, right? Um, because it comes from an animal. Yeah, and I, th I think it's, it's more about the, the, the cruel. Well, I, I guess I don't fully know, but I think it's the about factory, the, the factory life. So, yeah. 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 Trying to trying to demonstrate sustainability <clears> is <throat> is feasible. I've always I've always respected the intention behind it. And as long as it's not like being proselytized or evangelized at me, you know, I, I'm fine with you know people choosing what they want people making their own choices yeah exactly yeah. um dietary restrictions from a religious basis always just felt like a bizarre set of arbitrary rules that people were following right and and it's a shame sometimes when i see people like starving and and saying like oh but you can't eat cows because they're holy or you can't eat you know shellfish even though you live next to the ocean so you can feed your kids because that's an abomination food i would i would prefer if like even though I don't follow veganism, if there was like some sort of better underlying logic to support why people choose to do what they want and, and don't force other people to like follow the same set of rules. Anyway, guys, oh, <laughs> we're going to keep going. Unleavened wonders. This is for dessert after, after your dinner. Indulge in unleavened bread, Exodus 12, 8. Avoid the fluff and yeast and savor the bland cracker-like experience. Get creative by smearing it with a thin layer of honey for a touch of sweetness. Remember, the lack of leavening agents means no fluffy cakes or bread with texture, but it's all in the name of holiness. Hmm. Now, the thing is, you can actually buy unleavened bread. Have you guys ever eaten that before? Sure. No. No, but I've eaten crackers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I mean, in my mind, that's that's in the same ballpark. Unleavened bread tastes pretty good. It's like a, it's like a it's not puffy, but it's flaky. It fills you up. Uh, if it's the only thing I had to eat, I would say, okay, this sucks. But if I'm in the desert, it's an easy way to compact a lot of food in like a, a small form factor. A lot of food that we're, that I'm seeing is basically food that was around during the time that did not take a lot of effort to prepare and kept you away from potentially food poisoning yourself by eating mm -hmm. unknown forms of food. Do you guys see a theme with this at all? I, I I see you, you know you you'd said uh, arbitrary rules mm -hmm. and I think looking back at it now it seems arbitrary but in my mind you know these were probably put in place to keep people from getting sick or uh, uh dying um you know the rules on meats and how to cut things and things like that I think had a a rational uh basis in the sense that they were you know you're you're, you're trying to talk to some followers so to speak and get mm. them to do the right thing uh you know if you if you say god says so it's a lot easier to well, get everyone in line yeah, especially pork when you got right uh, real problems with pork but I, I have never understood the reason why you would stay away from crustaceans i, I mean that, i think they're pretty so safe in, food so in my mind crustaceans are the sort of food where once you kill it you have to eat it right whereas like a fish you can kill it keep it cold and like maybe eat it like they didn't days. have cold back then though <laughs> salt. <laughs> salt, right? <laughs> preserve it and salt so like if if a salesman comes to your town they're like hey i have some fresh lobster but you don't know if it's actually fresh or, or shrimp and you don't actually know if it's actually fresh or not you can eat yeah. that you can be really sick for a long period of time and that that's a drain on your society right so like what's a good way to stop that from happening well i mean it could easily have been they're they're so handy about it, handing out rules no. in the religions they could easily just say only eat uh, shellfish if you kill it yourself and eat but it immediately. They probably you know, didn't but, fully understand it though. They they right. probably mm -hmm. you know it was they were hearing of people eating shellfish and then getting sick. Yes. They didn't they didn't do the math. They didn't have data to support it. They just you know what? Let's just not eat it. Right, right. The civil engineering back, uh, acumen to make uh, intelligent <laughs> choice. They were just a reactionary like, what do we do to keep ourselves safe? These people. I've heard that people eat this and get sick. You know, we're, or maybe you've seen it. Yeah, we're a tribe we're going to the desert. We can't afford to lose <clears throat> our blacksmith 
our yeah. our sheep herder like let's just say no shellfish period flat flat down god says right, so. write that down write that down in the, in All right, the uh, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. okay no one can read though so uh, this is gonna oh, be right. uh, let's just make it an oral tradition i'm sure that'll be fine no one's gonna have an issue with that thousands of years from now <laughs> um <laughs> so down the road we'll write it down but it also strikes me as like what about pork right pork of like the main three meats that like americans eat that's the one that's most difficult to cook the one that you have to actually properly cook why is it why is that the case um i would say pigs don't necessarily live in a, a clean environment so like the way someone who can grow pigs may not necessarily be the most sterile butcher to begin with versus like someone who like kills cows and the only thing cows do is like stand in grass in their own manure for the most part pigs are always in slop they don't have good diets they go wild they can go feral if you don't maintain them uh there's a lot of stuff going on with pigs compared to like a chicken right not only that but when you have the meat you have to like properly you have to properly sanitize it by cooking it thoroughly there's no such thing as rare pork <laughs> you wouldn't want to eat <laughs> no. mm -mm. you wouldn't want to eat that but you can have a rare steak because the meat fibers are so thick it's like typically hard for like bacteria to go in you want to have you want to want to have rare poultry but it's very easy food to cook thoroughly because the fibers are so much more or less dense so it's smaller too smaller cuts right exactly so the meat goes right or the heat goes right through but pork is like dense and potential for a lot of bacterial infections so i'm not surprised and uh parasitic infections exactly yeah there's a lot of stuff going on that porks care are robust enough to live through but humans mm -hmm. can't if we eat their flesh right uh, mm -hmm. goats not as much of a problem sheep not much of a problem but definitely pigs so i'm not surprised that the the order on hey i heard that a lot of people ate pigs and got sick let's just say no pigs no pigs no shellfish it's all the food that's that's prone to cause people to get sick that we were saying don't eat right yeah like it's not a coin like in my head that's not even a coincidence that's just a a, a poor understanding of the time of what was germ theory right yeah. and we didn't really have germ theory until like the 1600s so like or that was that was a bizarre concept for a lot of people of being like if i wash my hands and i give birth the baby doesn't die as often <laughs> right. and the mother right right and that took like an extra 400 years for people to be like Maybe they were on to something with this. Florence I, Nightingale, right? Yeah, I don't want to be a sissy washing my hands for no <laughs> reason. All right, I'm a doctor. <laughs> okay, anyway. Uh, in that same vein, there's this really interesting dynamic between drinking water versus drinking alcoholic beverages like mead or wine because the alcohol that's in those beverages act as a natural disinfectant. So in times when it was very hard to get clean water, if you had access to like alcohol or fermentation capabilities and you could drink wine that had some water content in it that was like the way how people would stay unfortunately hydrated mm -hmm. which caused a lot of other problems but we didn't study that very thoroughly but it brings up the last uh part of this food diet which is wine wonderland beverages end your day with a glass of wine 1 timothy 5 23 citation it's not just for communion wine was considered a blessing in biblical times be sure to enjoy it responsibly and moderately Unfortunately, the divine diet does not include cocktails, spirits, or craft beer. Only wine. So say goodbye to your favorite craft brewery. Now that I didn't know. Hmm. I didn't know beer was not allowed. Okay. Larry, thoughts on that? Go ahead. Larry, are you a wine drinker? No. <clears throat> no, but I, I'll drink beer, but not wine very much. Now, mm -hmm. the thing that blows my mind is, Greece has a lot of wineries. They have the proper climate to grow grapes and a lot of the long lasting expertise in, in that area to be able to do so. But America, except for like Napa Valley or very like other weird locations, don't have access to wine. But all these foods that we're talking about are very specific to the geolocation of where these people are. Like wine, Greece, I can point to it. Like uh, obviously, manna was rained on the certain people, and who knows if that even actually exists. But the beans that they're referring to, the idea that there's fish and lobsters and shellfish to talk about, like lobsters and shellfish don't live everywhere in, on the earth. They only live in very particular, you know, areas that are like next to the sea. And when you think about where the, the Bible stories get like written, it's typically areas that have like Dead Sea, Black Sea, you know, like right next to it. It's like that weird persian mediterranean mesopotamian really truly area 
I'm not surprised. We were talking about coincidences earlier in the show, and I'm just saying, like, in, similar to how we see different cultures point to the same cross, I'm seeing a culture that's surrounded by these very, very specific kinds of food being also responsible for making these kinds of food or listing these kinds of foods as the only ones you're allowed to eat. And I, I just find that like, yeah, that makes perfect sense for a group like that to be surrounded by those kinds of foods to, to make this very specific kind of list. Because this list wouldn't work in Native America. This list wouldn't work in Alaska. It wouldn't work right. in China, right? They'd be like, what's a lobster? <laughs> 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 it's an abomination. Don't worry about it. Uh, and if you're in Japan and you can't eat, and you can't eat oysters, like that's going to be a problem. So it's an interesting concept. All right, guys. Yeah, we used to brew our own mead uh, uh, at home, actually. My dad would, mm. would make it. It was, it was pretty cool. I'm working on making uh, my own pizza dough huh. where I'm making from scratch and I'm having flour and active yeast. And I am loving working with bacteria again. That's not in the scope of within a laboratory. It's just mm-hmm. like I know how to treat them just right. And not shock them and like put them in water and let them ferment and be like, oh, you're so happy, aren't you? I'm going to wait for a couple of generations in this cup to like live. And then I'm going to kill the rest of you guys as I make my pizza dough. But the idea that now that we understand the science, now that we have a better understanding of like how all these things work, it's not necessarily as taboo anymore. And obviously, we can find Christians that eat shellfish. We can find Christians that eat craft, drink craft beer. Is that is that an evolution of christianity or is it like it, it, is it due to god being more lenient or is it due to us just understanding the science and how to better take care of ourselves larry what do you think uh, personally i think they they eat it because they want to and they pick and choose what they want to do out of the bible or what you know what they don't want to do you and think the things that then? they want to do is biblically biblically commanded and that which they don't is just analogy Ooh. Uh, allegory that's what they did back then i can do what i yeah, want to now. right mm, uh, that's an interesting yeah. idea yeah. uh Bujo, what do you think so so yeah that's interesting you, you you point out you know wines in the bible timothy 523 you know glass of wine a day we've learned since then that you know drinking too much of it can make you kind of a menace to society possibly <laughs> so so fast forward to southern baptist and mm. they're like no drinking whatsoever oh and, that's and now, now you have folks going oh southern baptists you don't get to drink Ooh, but catholicism i can drink all about I it ha- i have to believe into the transubstantiation right uh okay uh you know body into bread and all that so okay so I, yeah the same same point it, people are picking well pe- perhaps people are picking and choosing based on their wants and desires uh you know, if you want to, you know, enjoy a, a, a beverage and this religion doesn't doesn't allow for it, you know, flip through the Rolodex and find one that does. Eric, you have an interesting point. It sounds like you're saying Christianity has evolved. And the thing about evolution is it's not always to a very specific target. It's just bifurcations. Mm-hmm. And whatever gets lucky gets lucky. Well so said. the Baptists say no alcohol and the Catholics say alcohol all the time. It's literally the blood of our savior. Mm-hmm. And and that just spreads out and will continue to bifurcate until we figure out who was right and who was wrong. Maybe one day wine becomes poisonous and only the Baptists survive. And that's the next generation yeah. of worldwide Christianity. But my thing is, is there not room for along one of these evolutionary pathways, a, a culture of religion that understands, you know, they didn't understand the science back then. That's why it was disallowed, because now we know how to properly cook food. Now we know how to properly balance the diet. Now we know how to better portion control so we don't become ornery or drunk or stuff like that. Is there not room for that kind of perspective? Larry, what do you think? Well, theoretically, <laughs> uh, theoretically, they got their uh, dietary restrictions directly from God. Who would know hmm. how, to, how to fix food if he knows everything? Now, I'm going to question that, but couldn't, couldn't, wouldn't that be a terrible cost for God to be like, listen, I got to explain biochemistry to you guys. I got to mm-hmm. explain like most of no, it's just three. three words, cook your food, you know, three words. He doesn't have to explain all that stuff. It's remember, these are dictates. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Right. Don't eat this. Say. Also uh-huh. words though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, don't eat that. 
even simpler. Yeah, but I'm hungry. My kids are starving. <laughs> <laughs> but that's back yeah. to your point ty that you know yeah. some of these some of these things were passed on orally mm. right and again they didn't understand much about you know uh, uh germ theory and, and and food safety and they're passing on these things that like like you said help keep people alive right right and and, and they're getting passed on and then finally the someone's like writing them down right. right and then you know it's it's this long game of telephone where you say something to someone and they say it's someone else and eventually gets written down and translated and that. And then you got some Southern Baptist looking at the book, reading it, mm. and then they're going to put their own interpretation on, it. you know, they said this, but the wine was really for this. And we'll just, we'll just get rid of it because it's causing problems. Well, sure. Look at Mormonism, all the restrictions they have and all the ones that they uh, got rid of. Yeah. I, I'm going to, I'm going to poke at us too. Cause I feel like even atheists have a problem where they, they pass on tradition despite the fact that they know there's better science out there yet they, they, they stick to the culture and I'm throwing this out here. It's going to be something that you'll smirk and laugh at, but it makes a lot of sense. Americans use toilet paper. There is no reason to continue to be using toilet paper when the whole world aside from America knows that the days are substantially more sanitary, efficient, clean, efficient at cleaning and less wasteful. Cause it's just water. It's water that cleans your, if you get mud on your hands, you're not going to take a dry, un, rigid piece of paper, wipe your hand and be like, my hands are clean now. And you just go on with the rest of your day. You're going to wash your hands with water and rinse it. And maybe you will use a smaller amount of paper to dry it, but that's basically it. We have bidets that we can install in our toilets now that are available to us on Amazon for like 20 bucks. We had a pandemic that taught us that toilet paper is actually a very valuable commodity and when you don't have it, it's almost enough to shut down your home, unless if you have a reusable, sustainable option, which is a bidet, which I've installed before even COVID happened. But when you try to sell the idea to Americans, it's even atheist Americans who love science, it's yeah. like, uh, yeah, I don't know, that's too European or that's not sanitary or anything like that. So what's your excuses to people who don't have bidets who both love science? Uh, I have small children or, you know, <laughs> that, that would be a hot mess. Uh, but no, you're, you're right. I think it's a paradigm kind of thing. You're just mm. something you're used to and it's different um, because I'll, I'll admit I, I was so happy to come home last night and flush toilet paper because I spent the last eight days uh, pooping in bathrooms with trash cans in them and you could not throw your toilet paper down the toilet. The plumbing just wasn't good enough. Right. Mm. Uh, actually, bidets would be a fantastic revolution yeah. in, in, in southern mexico and in mexico city because mm. yeah their plumbing can't handle the toilet paper so wow. everyone just throws them in a trash can in the, the bathroom it's so it's, in the bathroom mm. yeah so I, I i yeah and, and i mean that that adds all kinds of sanitation other things and right so, yeah i i should uh get on amazon larry what's your excuse what for not using a bidet yeah as a, as a person who loves science, understands cleanliness, understands sanitary, and spent the last 50 minutes chastising mm. Christians for not doing the, the mm. best for society and for the sake of science and stop listening to tired tradition. Have, Why don't have you have had, a bidet? We have, have this had all of that before. time while you were talking to think of an excuse and haven't yeah. come up with one. Exactly. <laughs> so. so I'm not saying it's up to human nature. I'm just saying we can pick on Christians in the show, but we also pick on atheists too. Like you, you guys, we are susceptible to the same follies that Christians can be because we're both humans. And my idea is uh, mm. science is a tool designed not just for Christianity, not just for atheists, not just for uh, men or women. It helps everybody. And the more we better understand it, the more we can immediately improve our lives. I was very iffy on the whole bad day situation. I thought it was bizarre. Then I had a, I don't know if I can say this on the radio, a clean back end. Is that the way it's best way to say it? It is a substantially different sensation than using toilet paper. Like it's night and day to smear until you don't see a smear. is such an archaic way of <laughs> cleaning what is like one of the most dirtiest things possible compared to just pushing a button and being like, okay, it's clean now. Let me just dry it. It's like immediately sensation wise. It's, it's, it's night and day difference. I can't imagine. I can't proselytize it to people. I won't go, you know, the, the aggressive route. I'm just saying it's an option that's there. It's available to you. And if you have hemorrhoids or if you have any sort of weird, you know, 
altercations that can come from not having access to toilet paper or your plumbing being backed yeah, up if you live out of the This is me constantly uh, really trying to think of a good segue. <laughs> <laughs> It's just it's the most <laughs> just, sustainable thing that you can do. <laughs> I'm not saying be a vegan. I'm saying you should use water to clean uh, uh, waste. It's the it's the most obvious thing that you should do. It's why we take showers and not just wipe ourselves with uh, A4 binder paper. Like we take we wash ourselves so, with water. So clean what's yourself. it's good? So A4 what's the best paper. biblically approved food that you can eat so that you don't need a toilet paper? <laughs> <laughs> I would say the legume option. You need fiber. You need to be able to push through things with your intestines. Yeah. But anyway, that is that is the show. Well, thank you guys so much. Sorry for the small, uh, putting you guys on the hot seat. But recommended, recommended. It's only a $20 add-on to any toilet. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different options for hot and water controls. It takes five minutes to install yourself. And even if oh, you're- Send me a link in the, in the chat. You're never too old. You're never too young. I, it's something that everyone's going to have. If you go to Japan- the toilets they have there are insane, and they're for the whole families. When I was in Sweden, they had heated seats. They had toilets to talk to you. They had ones that play white noise to, to keep you from mm -hmm. being self-conscious around the other people that you might be uh, using the bathroom with around. Yeah. It was amazing. Like Our toilet technology is really, really poor in the U.S., and we need to be able to recognize that and, and look at the science and improve upon it. It's good for everybody. And same thing with your diet. Look at the science. Take care of yourself at the end of the day, and don't let tradition or old rules dictate what you think is acceptable or what you're capable of doing. Bujo, what would you recommend we check out before next week? Um, oh, can I just throw out that that other Absolutely. little little Mexican thing? I we did go through a, a church, a Mayan church, mm. uh, that resisted some of the Catholic influences. Nice. Good for them. Yeah. <laughs> However, one of their uh, one of their things was if you had a sick loved one. Uh, that was, you know, uh, ill, you, you, you could bring in, of course, you bring in all kinds of things to, 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 to give to the gods, flowers and food and things, but a live chicken, you could sacrifice. Ooh. And they did it right there in the church. And, and my daughter was so uncomfortable in there. She had to run out. Um, and, uh, but yeah, they would, they would, they would kill the chicken, behead the chicken right there in the church, which was filled with, with pine needles on the floor and candles everywhere. I was scared to death. I didn't see a fire. I'm knocking over one thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just, just <laughs> and the, there were I dogs. Think were the pine there. needles on the floor? Speaking I don't of, know. Yeah, I mean, was it a single layer or was it three inches? No, it's a single layer. Speaking oh, of okay. divine uh, <laughs> protection, right? But right. Yeah. So then, but then they would take the chicken home and bury it, and the chicken would would soak up all of the 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 the, sins. the, the disease. And the per person you wanted, you loved, would, mm. would heal. And I just couldn't help think, looking around, these people are poor. They can't, they can't afford to to take one of their healthy chickens and give it and just bury it, right? For for magic reasons. Sure. And I just it shook my head. And I know it's a, they're preserving the culture, and I appreciate. it. And our guide was really cool, and also agnostic. Nice. Um, so because we had some conversations, and he and he he, yeah. he kind of agreed. But anyway, sorry, long winded, but I wanted to share that that piece too. Just just sad to me to see a church again taking money from poor people for right magical reasons. It it breaks my heart to know that that's also a story that has parallels in Christianity with people burning goats because yeah. not to burn a goat. It it hurts my heart to know that toilet paper companies are still making money off of dumbfounded Americans who don't know that water is a better way to clean between their legs. I have the same sympathy God. on all levels for the exact yes. same reason. Where's your contradiction? Yeah. <laughs> Larry, Larry, go on ahead. Oh. Well, I'd like to remind everybody that if they're having trouble leaving religious beliefs behind, um, then you can get help from, from uh, recovering from religion at recoveringfromreligion.org. Mm. My content can be found at digitalfreethought.com. Be sure to click on the blog button for a radio show archives, atheist songs, and many articles on the subject. You can find my book, Atheism, What's It All About, on Amazon. And my YouTube channel handle is at Doubter5. Remember, everybody's going to somebody else's hell. The time to worry about it is when they prove that heavens and hells and souls are real. 
Until then, don't sweat it. Enjoy your life. And we'll see you next Wednesday night at 7 o'clock here on WOZO Radio. Say bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. bye.